All right. So I'm here to talk to you today about some teaching opportunities I had outside of the classroom. So I'm a PhD student, and when I came into the university, I was really, really excited about all of the research I was going to do. I was really excited about the specific project I got brought on for. And I was brought on as a RA, so a research fellow. And I've been pretty much a research fellow my entire program. And what that means is that I don't really get a chance to teach. I'm not allowed to um, teach. And so I didn't really discover how much I like teaching until I had a chance to coach the English equestrian team about four years ago. So about four years ago, we had a faculty member in ADVS leave, um, and we weren't able to find an appropriate replacement in time before the new semester started. And so I have a really uh, strong background in horseback riding. I grew up showing uh, English equitation, which is where, so we don't wear the cowboy hats, we're the ones who wear the tall boots and the show jacket, and we jump our horses around courses. So this is what I grew up showing since I was a little kid. Um, I did equine science at Colorado State University for my undergrad and was involved in a lot of equine science research when I was there. So people at the department knew that I had this background and asked if I'd be willing to take on this coaching, um, this team, since they didn't have a faculty member to do so. And they didn't have to twist my arm at all. I thought that sounded really fun, but as I'm sure a lot of you experienced with your first teaching experience, it was kind of trial by fire. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. I had never taught adults before. I had given small children horseback riding lessons, and that was about it. So I came in to about 12 to 14 students who some of them were older than me. We have a lot of non-traditional students here at Utah State University. A lot of them have been on the team for several years. So it was really intimidating coming in as a new instructor, even outside of the classroom, and trying to figure out how to take on that role. And what I noticed is, a lot of the things that we do outside of the classroom in coaching are things that we should be doing in the classroom. And as I got more and more help from city and understanding as I transitioned into the classroom how to be a good teacher, I had a lot of moments of, wait, I've, I've done this before. It was just in kind of a different way. And so that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today was kind of the things that we can get outside of the classroom to bring into the classroom. So one of the things that we do in coaching a lot is this backwards course design. And we're kind of lucky with this because for coaching, our start, middle, and end is with the assessment. The horse show for us is everything. It's whether we know our students are going to be successful or not. And we know exactly what our students need to be able to do to be successful at that show. I'm sure it's the same for coaching a soccer game. That game, everything you're doing is leading up to whether or not your students can do well in that game. And so for us, we jump horses. So I still am involved with the English team. I assistant coach now, and this is actually a picture of our coach, Kelly Munns. So when you're jumping a horse, there are a couple different things you need to be able to do to be successful. You need to have really strong legs. You need your legs to not move around. That's what's holding you on the horse. So if your legs start slipping back, you're probably going to fall off as soon as they land. You need to be able to follow with your hands so that the horse isn't getting pulled on, because the second you pull on them, they're probably not going to jump for you very much anymore. And there's a lot of mental skills we expect our students to have, too, in order to ride that horse well. So it's kind of similar to what we see in a classroom where in order for our students to be successful, we break down those bigger goals of being able to jump a fence into these smaller, more achievable goals that are a little bit more specific. And so in this case, one of the things that's really important for us is being able to use our legs to keep a horse straight and turn. You aren't going to be able to jump a course if you can't do this. But we don't go through and tell our students, hey, one of the things you're going to be tested on is using your legs to keep a horse straight and turn. What you do is you fill up the practice time with different drills, different practices, for the students to be able to build this skill. So one of the things we use a lot is that a rider can make square turns in three steps or less. Pretty much based on where you're at and based on where you're going to go, you need to know that you can get from point A to point B correctly. And this is really important when it builds up to the bigger assessment. But what it comes down to is, if our assessment looks like this course on the right, this really complicated jumping course, we aren't going to just have the students run through that course over and over and over again and hope that they eventually figure out how to be successful. We're going to take that final assessment and we're going to break it down into smaller, more achievable learning goals. So for example, uh, being able to turn your horse to be able to make that jump seven. It's a pretty intense turn. So one of the things we're interested in is building up course material, building these drills where the students can practice one manageable skill at a time, and then eventually they build those drills together so that they can take on a bigger, more complicated uh, objective. 
So in the classroom, this looks a lot like backwards course design. So we start with what we want the students to know. And again, in coaching, we're kind of lucky because we're told what the students need to know to leave. We know what they need to do to be successful in the show. But in courses, a lot of times we have the same thing. Our department tells us based on curriculum what our students need to know by the time that they leave our course. You know what vocabulary your student needs to know in order to move on to the next more advanced class. So from there, you build up learning objectives based on what your students need to know by the time they leave your class. And then you decide how you're going to test those skills. So for us, this looks like the horse show. But we also want to practice testing those skills in a low stakes environment. So we just don't throw the students out into the horse show where they're practicing some of these skills for the first time. We have them practice these skills. And we decide how we're going to test them to assess whether or not they're meeting those learning objectives. And so from there, you design course lessons, or for us, it's practice material for, to specifically address whether those students have the ability to comprehend those skills and really perform those skills well. Um, and so when we're looking at in the classroom, we kind of start with learning objectives and move on to assessments, and then we kind of build the course out with course material. And so this is something that comes really naturally in a coaching situation, but less so in the classroom. So then I'm curious, I, don't, I can walk around with the mic, but how you guys have put together course material or backwards course design in your courses or seen examples of this outside of the classroom. I know for us, we're trying to rebuild a course right now, revamp it, and one of the things we do is we essentially build out a huge Excel sheet and we put all of the learning objectives in one column and then we start to build out the assessment. So we actually will write out the test bank questions and connect it to each learning objective to be able to tell kind of if things match up. And then from there, we can build out the course material to make sure that we're actually addressing these skills so the students can pass the assessment. Does anyone, I mean, this turns into a massive Excel sheet. So out of curiosity, does anybody has experimented with this and found maybe a better way to do it than a very large Excel sheet? So um, one of the other things that I've noticed comes really naturally in coaching is the scaffolding. So we always start when we have a new skill that we want the student to learn, we start by telling the student about the skill. It's really similar to the lecture. They're off the horse, we're talking to them, we're telling them what they need to know, why it's important for them to know this skill, and how, how to do it, essentially. And then normally we talk about different weaknesses that we see, and we'll point out specific things for them to focus on. So what do we really want them to focus on achieving their first time practicing through? So then the student completes this task individually, but they have a lot of feedback from peers and instructors. Um, you can see in the back of this picture, I'm there with a the microphone, so I'm normally there. I'm, you can't ride the horse with the student, but you can guide that student through. You can call out what weaknesses you see. You can remind them of what they're supposed to be doing. And it gives us this really valuable immediate feedback where if the student's doing something wrong, you can really immediately correct that and kind of get them back on that right path. The other thing we do is a lot of peer-to-peer -peer interaction. So um, with a 12-person team, it probably sounds tiny compared to most of our classrooms. But even with two of us, we can't give every student the one-on-one -on -one instruction that they need every single practice. So we really use peers here and kind of promote that peer-to-peer -peer learning where students are working with each other a lot. We have the more advanced students kind of teach the more beginner students, work with them through some of those exercises so that even though the student is completing that task individually, they're doing it with support from both the peers on the team as well as the instructor. And so then we have the student complete the task completely individually without any feedback. And this normally happens at a horse show, but we'll also do, again, kind of practice assessments. We do practice shows with our students so that they get used to that environment of the horse show. And one of the things that's really nice with our students in the team that I would love to be able to get going in the classroom at some point is the students see this assessment and completing this task individually as a, a, a learning opportunity. So they come to us afterwards, they ask what they did wrong, what they could do better. It's not something where they just complete this assessment and they're done with it forever. They actually want to know what they did wrong. They want to know what they can do better. And that's something that is, would be really valuable if we can get that attitude in our classrooms and create assessments that are more of a learning uh, opportunity than they are just a one and done test. So in the classroom, we look at this as the guided release of information or scaffolding. 
And so this starts out with the teacher bearing a lot of the responsibility with focused instruction. So the instructor is a lot of times lecturing, they're giving some background knowledge, they're maybe demonstrating what that skill is. And then the next step is guided instruction. So this is kind of where we do it together. And that student is getting hopefully some really quick feedback, some pretty fast feedback. If not immediate, it's really hard to give immediate feedback. <laughs> they don't normally give you a microphone where you can call out students for doing something wrong the second you see it. Um, and just giving that chance to correct misconceptions, any confusion that the students have, and then moving on to where the student is bearing a lot of the responsibility for the learning. So where the students are doing things together and they're working with their peers and they're working to give feedback. So I think that student feedback is really valuable both for the student receiving the feedback, but also for the students giving the feedback. There's really no better way to figure out that there's a gap in your knowledge about something than trying to teach it to somebody else and having them be like, this makes no sense to me. And you're like, oh, I, it doesn't make any sense to me either. Who knew? Um, and then once we kind of get to that bottom of student responsibility, we go into independent learning. And so I think that talking about you do it alone makes it sound like, all right, you go in the corner, you go take this test, and that's independent learning. But I think independent learning also is the student taking something away from that exam, taking something away from that final project, going out and doing some independent research, looking more in depth, kind of creating an individual who feels like they can go out and continue to learn outside of the classroom. And so a lot of times we use this as assessment, but I think that seeing our assessment as, again, a learning opportunity for the students is a really valuable thing. Um, so again, does anybody, uh, in terms of scaffolding in the classroom, how do you guys, what is your favorite way of doing it? Does anybody have any specific strategies they like to use? Not so much? That's okay. Yeah? As nursing, we use simulation a lot. And so it goes with first explaining it, then you demonstrate it, then they demonstrate it back to you. And then you run the assessment of how it, they follow through. And not so much dinging them all the time, but helping them sh see for themselves what they did well and what they need to change. So, yeah, definitely. And that also feeds really perfectly into the next thing that uh, we do a lot in the classroom, which is, so if you've ever played a sport, you've probably heard, practice doesn't make perfect, perfect pra practice makes perfect. Or you play the game the way you practice, so we wanna practice the way you play the game. And I think that this is really important. If this is what our horse shows look like, I would very much struggle to prepare my students for this correctly. There is absolutely no way that I, with the facilities we have, could prepare our students to um, horse show with that many people watching. The mental pressure of that many people watching your every move stresses a lot of students out, a lot of people out. Um, an arena that is so large, so airy, probably really echoey with a lot of announcers, probably different languages. There's a lot of different pieces to this that a student would want to be prepared for before going into this situation. Luckily for us, uh, our horse shows look like the bottom left picture. Oh, it's a small, a little bit smaller, just a little bit. Um, so we have a bunch of different riders in the arena. A lot of times we have jumps that have been torn down from whenever the jumpers have gone through, or if they're one of the jumping students, they have a course there. And one of the things that's really special about the way our sport works is that these aren't our students' horses. Uh, our students pull the name of the horse they're gonna ride out of a hat, and in theory, they've never ridden this horse before. Most of the time, they haven't. We go to Colorado for our shows, so they don't get a lot of practice on the horses out there. So they're on a horse that they've never ridden before. They aren't allowed to even really touch it. They get on, they pick up the reins, they go straight into the arena. So that's an aspect of their assessment that we really have to prepare them for. You can bet that in our practice, we're putting them on different horses every single chance we can get. We're swapping them around so that they get that practice for what that assessment is gonna be like. We also put them in the arena with a lot of other riders. So the left top picture is what our practices actually look like. And there's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of students moving around that they have to learn how to kind of pass safely and correctly. Um, and uh, jumps up, different things that they have to avoid. The whole point of practice is to make it as close to that show experience as we can, because that's how our students are gonna be the best mentally prepared. 
And then we'll do also practice shows where the students are out there in a group, we're calling out to them what they should be doing, and they're not getting any immediate feedback about what they're doing right or wrong. And they're coming to us afterwards and we're talking to them about what they should be doing. And this goes in the classroom as well. I know as a student, I'm still, I will forever be a student maybe, it's been a long time, but um, the classes that were the absolutely most terrifying for me were the ones that had all of the points in a midterm and a final. And you're like, I have no idea what this teacher is gonna be uh, testing on. I don't know their style for what kind of questions they ask. I don't know what type of content, how deep that content goes. And you go into it not being able to know whether or not you are adequately prepared for that examination or not. And so by using low stake assessments that are in the exact same format as our high stake assessments, we can help prepare our students for that high stake assessment. And more than that, we give them a chance and a learning opportunity to assess themselves, to assess whether or not they are adequately prepared for that examination. It also gives them an idea of what that testing environment is gonna be like. So is it gonna be essay? Am I gonna be having to answer test questions really quickly? Or can I take my time through this and really kind of read the questions carefully? One of the ways that we've done this in our class is we used to get feedback that the students wanted more quizzes. They wanted more of an ability to see whether or not they're prepared for the assessments. And at first we gave them these quizzes in just like short answer form. And my idea of it was, well, if you can answer these big topic ideas, if you can answer these well, then you know you're prepared for the exam because these are the things that I think are important and I test on what I think is important. But what we found is that really what was better was we created these test banks and we created quiz banks at the exact same time. So that all of the questions that are in the quizzes are the exact same format and sometimes just reworded or kind of flipped versions of what was on the exam. So that instead of getting a short answer in paper, no timer version of the exam, they were getting an online exam or online quiz just like the exam is online and they're getting pretty much the exact same type of questions that they would be getting in the test. So out of curiosity, again, does anybody have any kind of strategies they like to use in the classroom to achieve this? Yeah. With those low state quizzes, I like to allow them to take it as many times as they would like and to keep the best score. Um, it's low stakes, so it really doesn't affect their grade that much, but it allows them the practice to be able to go in and take it as many times as they would like, to, and, and it's practice for the assessment. So that's one thing that I like to do. Do you have them, um, are they able to see what questions they get wrong when they go through? I'm trying to remember. I've done it both ways. I, I'm yeah. trying to remember, but I think they do like to see that. They do like yeah. to go back and see what they did wrong. What I really like about the online testing is it jumbles the answers. It randomizes the answers. And so they're not just memorizing A, B, C, and D. They have to actually know the answer. And, and so I, I like that. And, and I do think the students really enjoy that. They it's, it's practice for the assessment. They know what type of questions you're going to ask. They know what you're looking for. It's not a, a surprise to them. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, we were talking about whether or not to allow to show answers on the quizzes that we're doing. And we, I think we're going to try not showing them what answers they got wrong, specifically to be like, if you want to get full points, you're going to have to go through and not just dig up the answer to the question you got wrong, but you're going to have to go through and dig through all of the quiz questions to figure out even what question was the one that I got wrong. So we'll see how it works. We may get some complaints on that one. Of, But does anybody else have any strategies they use for this? All right. So the very last thing I'm going to talk about is relatedness in between our students. So. Again, a lot of these, it's a lot easier to do in a 12-person team than it is a 150-person biology gen ed course. Um, but allowing our students to relate to each other and not just relate with the instructor really improves their experience, and I think it allows them to take a lot more meaning out of the course. My students, when they win a class at the horse show, they might be excited about it. They'll come up and jump around with me a little bit. Um, but when they go back to their team, and they know they won. In this case, the um, girl with the ribbon is able to go on to the next step, which is we call it zone. So she's able to go um, out to Stanford and compete. 
they're in tears because it means so much to them and those people have been there for them and know how much work they put into this. And giving our students the ability to take a little bit more meaning out of a course, it means it really ups student learning and it ups student engagement. Um, but in a team, we also have the same issues that we have in the classroom. If we have, if we're teaching a lesson in the arena and we have three girls on the outside of the arena kind of giggling and talking about something else, it's going to detract from the experience for everybody. It's going to be a distraction. So what we really focus on is finding structured ways for the students to interact with each other. We assign roles and it's a lot easier again. It's easy in a team to be like, well, we need two team captains, we need a secretary, we need someone to handle social media. And so it's a little bit more natural to assign students those roles, but then also assigning them other roles like, okay, so today you're going to be teaching the beginner students how to do this. Or I want you guys to go take on this task and you delegate however you want. But making sure that students know the expectations of them and giving them that responsibility by structuring how they're interacting with their peers has helped us a lot. We've gotten to the point with our team, and it was not like this at first, but we've gotten to the point where our students will come together outside of practice and they'll watch videos of horse shows and they'll take notes on what those people are doing well, on what people who are successful in the area they want to be successful in are doing correctly. Um, and they don't do this because they're required to, they do this because they honestly just want to do well. And this isn't something that every team does, but it's something that over the years we've been able to find kind of something that works to get those students to care and do that by relating to each other. And this matters a lot in the classroom too. And I think really the key to making sure that our students can relate to each other and have time for that peer-to-peer -peer interaction without it detracting or distracting from the learning is making sure that those opportunities are structured in a way where the students are really getting the full breadth of perspectives, experiences, and the diversity of the students around them. Um, I also think that, again, it's hard in a team of 12, we can give a lot of individual attention. But in a classroom, allowing each individual to have an impact on their learning environment, every year or every semester we teach a course. That course has a slightly different feel because of the different students that are in it. Different students have different interests, they're gonna ask different questions. And I think that allowing the classroom to be as dynamic as it can be in order to allow those students to impact their environment, it really gives a lot more meaning to that topic for the students and it gives them a little bit more engagement with the material. So being able to kind of utilize the diversity in our students and when they're interacting with each other and they're talking about what interests them or what personal note they may have with that topic, it's a way for them to individualize that learning experience that we can't give 150 students, but they may be able to do with each other to some extent. And being able to structure kind of those group interactions, I think is one of kind of the key things for this. So this is definitely a really difficult one in the classroom to figure out the right way to achieve this. Has any, again, anybody have any great strategies, the magic bullet that they'd like to share with everyone? <laughs> it's um, close. It's, I teach a project management class that I require them to write a team charter. Um, so each team kind of defines how they're going to interact with each other throughout the semester. And I used to kind of just give them a template and said these are the kind of things you need to address. But last semester I gave them really like guided questions to discuss with each other. Um, so like um, how do you uh, manage conflict? And then from that derive like their conflict policy. So it started off trying to get them to engage in really specific kinds of conversations. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of how it wound up. And I, I mean, the, the kind of charters that they wound up with in the end from that was like so much more specific to the group. But also I think, like I, I kind of going into it assumed that they would know things like conflict or like what type, you know, how do they want to be approached about their behavior or whatever, but they, don't, they didn't know they probably never thought about it. So having those conversations was really important. So. Awesome, thanks. Does anyone else have any strategies? For, yeah, awesome. So I work with adults and I teach ESL and something that I have discovered is some students are very social and then some are more um, introverts by nature. And so I am constantly switching up the time when I put them in groups and like the sizes of the group. So sometimes I just almost do like a line and we rotate in like one minute, two minute intervals. So it's just one on one, they just have a partner. 
Um, and then other times I'm having him work in like threes or fours and kind of larger groups. And I think that's been effective because some of the more quiet students that wouldn't really pick up or wouldn't speak up as much in a big group, they're forced to when they just have a partner because they both have to kind of work together. Um, but I think varying the time helps too so that because too much time in group work, then sometimes the conversation goes away from what I want them to be talking about, which in an English class, I'm okay if they're still in the target language, but um, for other classes, I can, in, in other classes, I can see how that would be a problem at. Awesome. Sweet. Anybody else? Awesome. So, yeah, I think that um, giving the students that peer-to-peer -peer interaction, and it'll be interesting. So, we're trying to put students together in um, about a six-person group that they're going to be in consistently and rotating the roles that each student will play in that group. So whether they're kind of a leader and have to take on the role of really getting everyone together and organizing them to write, you know, do the activity. Um, and we were kind of hoping, sometimes we've had, it's a hybrid course, so some of the, the lectures are all online. and We struggled a little bit with students not necessarily um, having the self-control to go through and watch all of the lectures that they should be watching. And so we had issues with some of the discussions not necessarily being as um, in-depth as they should have been. And so we're hoping by kind of creating some accountability to some of the other students in the group that it might create that uh, a little bit more responsibility to engage with the topic and then actually have kind of a better, more in-depth group, group discussion. Um, so pretty much my lesson from all of this was that if I had known what I should have been taking away from coaching four years ago, my transition as I started teaching more and more in the classroom would have been a lot easier. Because again, as I've gone through and gone to the UTE conference, gone to different city workshops, there's been that little voice in the back of my head being like, oh, I, I used to do this. And for some reason, when I went into the classroom, I completely forgot that this was a thing I should be doing. Um, and I think that to some extent, the way we see somebody who is a coach and somebody, the way we see somebody who's a teacher, we have kind of different stereotypes about what those actions are. So because a coach is maybe teaching something that's athletic, something that's physical, we see it as a more active role. And because a lot of times those teams are a little bit smaller, we see it as somebody who knows if something's going on outside of the team that may be impacting that student's performance. And it's someone that can be a little bit of a cheerleader too, right? When your team wins, you're there for your students. You're really excited for them. And I think sometimes we fall into a trap of seeing teaching as something that's really passive. That we're going to stand up here and we're going to lecture at our students. Our classes are too big to really kind of get to know those students on a personal level. And that we aren't necessarily as excited for them when they do well. It's more of an expectation of, well, if you work hard, you'll get an A. There's your cheer right there. Um, so out of curiosity, has anybody here had some non-traditional teaching experiences that they have kind of brought into the classroom with them? or? I know some people have talked about things they got even out of parenting. Um, it doesn't just have to be coaching, but yeah. yeah. So I, I spent, I came to USU from teaching at a juvenile detention center for 10 years here in Logan. Um, but but you're, I lo you're bringing up a lot of really interesting points. Um, and I mean, you know, in coaching, it's easy to, you know, it's what one topic, I guess this is what I'm getting at. One topic I've been exploring lately um, with some of the stuff we're doing with the MBA students and the MBA program um, is um, finite games versus infinite games, right? So seeing, seeing what we typically see as, as something that has a finite result, right? So I coach soccer. Yeah. So soccer is a good, you know, you, you have a result, you ha it's all clear. You know, somebody's making the rules, somebody's a referee officiating. Right. At the end of the time, you know what happens, right? But, but seeing things as an infinite game is more growth promoting, is more long-term, you know, long-term vision, projection. Um, and, and so I, I can see some of that here where we have the opportunity to, with the assessments, with um, with scaffolding backward with things like that to um, I don't know I'm just thinking out loud yeah. I guess but the finite and infinite game I think I think that really really works well here and then the other thing that I try to do is just build a kind of a foundational philosophical framework right at the beginning and front load that these are the ideas that we are building everything from right so in you know 
like you said, nobody's talking on the side, right? So no distractions. Um, you know, hold yourself to the same standard you hold others to. You know, we, we build all these things in, and then we work from there. And so the scaffolding, I think, you know, the, the relatedness, right? Seeing others as people, you know, yeah. I- instead of objects or annoyances or something like that. Definitely. And I think it's something that we're a lot clearer on in, again, sort of a coaching or a team dynamic than we maybe are in our classroom sometimes. Because, for example, with like the backwards course design, I talked about kind of doing smaller drills to break down a larger skill. We're so good at those points at communicating, okay, this is what I want you to take from this drill. This is why this drill is important in you building this skill. And this is why this skill is important in you doing well in the game or the horse show and in your uh, goals, your larger goals outside of this team as to how you want to be a horse person. And part of that is because we get pushback from the students who if they're used to jumping around and you're like, no, no, now you're trotting over a pole. You have to convince them to give you some effort there. Um, But I think that really clear communication line too about Here's what the expectations are, but here's exactly why this is going to serve you in your end assessment or in your end goal as a human is something we definitely do a lot better. Um, it's sometimes a little easier in the team realm than it may be in the teaching realm. Oh, perfect. Anybody else? Or any questions? Yeah. No. I was just thinking this is incredibly relevant, especially... Um, if you're in online courses, because one of the biggest problems is it's so easy to dehumanize individuals in an online course. You're just a face, robot head, you know, and even from a teaching perspective, that can be a significant challenge. So I think this is something um, in terms of thinking about how are we coaching in online learning. Even with the IVC, I was in a presentation this morning and somebody said, you know, they enjoyed doing the poll everywhere. I think it was Marie said her students love doing that because then they felt like they were a part of the thing. And his comment over there uh, where he was talking about, you know, when we look at what are the expectations for that class, especially in some of those IVC broadcast online course elements, we should be thinking from the very beginning what are we doing in this class to bring these individuals together to help them gain greater perspective and have this relatedness even though we are never going to be in the same space at the same time whether that's zoom or some kind of group project there's so many different types of technology but it should be one of our primary objectives is to get there, is to see ourselves as coaching, even in those non-face-to-face situations. Yeah, and I think there are even tools online that can help us do this almost in a more organized or almost easier fashion than face-to-face. Because I know that like, if a student doesn't put in an assignment on time, you can send out an email or just to, a Canvas message just to those students being like, hey, notice you didn't put in this assignment. Like, Is everything OK? Do you need any help? Are you confused about it? Here are like, what the late. You know, if you want to turn it in late, here are your options and what that means. And just being able to, um, I feel like at least with the online course and some of those um, situations, you can almost flag the students that need a little bit help and like kind of brought into the fold of like, hey, I see you. I notice you aren't doing this and taking advantage of those tools to make sure that we're not kind of losing students along the way is valuable. So I think we might be out of time, but awesome. Thank you so much, you guys.